stuff so that you guys can see this. So on the recording, I'll kind of walk through what this means uh, once, and then in real world, we're going to go through it several times. So you've got your standard curve, the standard rate, normal temperature, normal environment, normal acidity, um, and that's going to be your normal rate of oxygen hemoglobin dissociation. There are going to be factors that change the rate at which things associate and dissociate. And those factors are going to be temperature, acid-base balance, and carbon dioxide concentration. So let's start with temperature, because I think that one's relatively easy. Uh, part of why this is challenging is you haven't had chemistry yet. You won't have chemistry till quarter five. Um, so when we talk about acid-base balance and carbon dioxide, that one's going to be a little bit of a stretch but we can make it work. Uh, same with temperature. When we talk about temperature, it's going to impact your chemical reactions. Higher temperatures are going to make chemical reactions happen faster. Colder temperatures are going to make chemical reactions happen slower. And that's how I connect the idea of temperature to this association curve. So you have your normal body temperature, about 38 degrees C. If your body temperature increases, you will release oxygen more readily into tissues. So even in the presence of more oxygen, less binding will occur. It is less association, more just so dissociation. So elevated temperatures, the phrase that we use here, shifts the curve to the right. Again, I'm going to repeat that. When it shifts the curve to the right, that means even in the presence of more oxygen, less of it will be bound up in hemoglobin. That enables us to release more oxygen into tissue. So far so good? Okay. In cold temperatures, hypothermia, uh, you're going to have the opposite effect. You're going to have a left shift, which means that oxygen will be bound to hemoglobin more readily. And that means that there's going to be less delivery of oxygen into tissues. It's going to be too tightly connected to hemoglobin. So again, I'm going back to the chemistry concept of this, where when the temperature is elevated, molecules move a lot faster, so that oxygen is going to move away from hemoglobin more readily. In colder temperatures, molecules move a lot less. So oxygen is going to be bound more tightly, and it's going to be less likely to move away from hemoglobin. Does that work for you guys? Okay, so temperature is probably our easiest one. I like temperature. Next, I want to do acid-base. What you need to understand about acids and bases, if you haven't focused on it before, is that moving too far away from either, in either direction, they're both dangerous. You don't want to get too acidic. You don't want to get too basic. There's a lot of terminology here. So basic is the same as alkaline. You could also say less acidic, but you want to be careful with these less and more terms right now. Because when we're acidic, the pH decreases. Less than 7 pH value means acidic. More than 7 pH value means basic or alkaline. So as acidity increases, pH decreases. I'm saying this verbally right now. I'm going to put this all up on the board later. I'm just doing it for the recording. So when you have more acidity, you have more free hydrogen ions. That's what an acid is. There's a lot of free hydrogen ions in it. And those free hydrogen ions are going to mess with molecules. They're going to make molecules separate from each other. They're going to make atoms separate from each other. So the way I can connect this most easily to this curve that we're looking at is that you've got oxygen bound to hemoglobin. If that acid is there, it's going to make them separate. So high acidity, once again, is going to create a right shift. Even with more oxygen around, less of it will be associated with hemoglobin. It will dissociate more easily in an acidic environment. So that's a right shift which means alkalinity or basicity, those things mean the same thing, they mean a pH above 7, is going to do the opposite. It's going to create a left shift 
that oxygen will be more tightly bound to hemoglobin. If you don't like the chemistry concepts, throw them out the window for now and wrote memorize that high temperature causes right shift, low temperature causes left shift. High acidity causes right shift, basicity causes left shift. Now, the third concept is carbon dioxide. When I taught at Metro, I taught the Gen Bio Labs, and one experiment we did showed that when you bubble carbon dioxide through water, when you pump it in through water, carbon dioxide plus water creates something called carbonic acid. And I can actually show you a video of that, um, that experiment, and I think we should because visualizing that is going to be very important because we're going to have respiratory acids. Carbon, carbonic acid is known as a respiratory acid. So if you have elevated carbon dioxide, there you therefore are more acidic. Your internal environment is more acidic. Therefore, elevated carbon dioxide is going to do the same thing that elevated acid did. And is that going to be a right or left shift? Right shift. Good. Conversely, if you have low carbon dioxide, that means you're going to have a more basic internal environment. And that is going to be a right or left shift? Left shift. So they're going to be connected and correlated. I am comfortable lumping in elevated carbon dioxide with acidity and low carbon dioxide with basicity. That way you just have to remember what acids and bases do. That's my recommendation. Your mileage may vary. Sound good to you guys so far? Okay, so one more time before I turn off the recording. Normal temperature, normal acidity, uh, you're going to, and normal carbon dioxide concentrations. Here's your curve. A right shift represents elevated temperature, an acidic environment, or elevated carbon dioxide. A left shift means that oxygen is more tightly bound to hemoglobin, and that will happen in conditions of low temperature, a basic or alkaline environment, or low carbon dioxide concentration. So we watched a video called Bromo Blue Test for Carbon Dioxide. We did a small explainer for acids and bases. And we connected the idea of carbon dioxide to the idea of acidity. If you have carbon dioxide in water, then you have carbonic acid. We call it a respiratory acid. And if you are breathing correctly, you have the correct amount of carbon dioxide in your bloodstream. If you stop breathing, if you stop exhaling, you're going to build up your carbon dioxide, which means you're going to build up your acidity. It also means, and this is a long-term thinking thing for you, it also means that if you are hyperventilating, if you're sitting here going, <laughs> you are off-gassing more carbon dioxide, that means your carbon dioxide level in your blood is low, and you can become <laughs> alkaline. And those are medical conditions. Alkalosis and acidosis are both problematic. Therefore, our control of our nervous system uh, our nervous system innervation of our respiratory muscles is partially based on our acid-base balance. So these are all connected ideas, and that should be up there, but it's not. There we go. We're back. Okay, how do you feel about this curve right now? Scale of 1 to 10. We got a, we got a 5, I think, over there. Uh, is there anything you want me to focus on, or do you think you need more time with it? More time with it? Okay. And you will have practice with this on your worksheet as well. So most of your oxygen will be found transported as bicarbonate ions. That's not the same thing as bicarbonate acid. You actually have certain cells responsible for transforming your uh, carbon dioxide into bicarb. And bicarb is actually a buffer. So bicarb actually helps you stay in between acids and base. It helps you stay at your preferred pH. Does anybody know the ideal pH for the human bloodstream? 7.35 approximately. Yeah, that was good. 7.4, 7.3, 7.35. So most of it will be transported as bicarb. 
and that's actually a buffer and that's going to help you with your acid base balance. 20% will be bound to hemoglobin and a small amount will be dissolved in plasma. And this is on your worksheet as well just because I want you to know the general frequency. I want you to know that most of it's bicarb, some of it's bound to hemoglobin, some of it's dissolved in plasma. Is this 7 to 10% dissolved in plasma that gives you that carbonic acid, that gives you that acidosis or alkalosis we were talking about? <coughs> so again, slow, shallow breathing. If you are not breathing enough, you are going to increase your load of carbon dioxide in your plasma. And that is going to drop your pH. Rapid deep breathing is going to decrease the amount of CO2 in your plasma of your blood, and that's going to increase your pH, which makes you more basic. And this works backwards and forwards. So if your bloodstream, if your nervous system detects that you are acidic, it will try to compensate by breathing more. And if it detects that you are alkaline, it will make you breathe less and retain carbon dioxide. So when we get to patho, we're going to have all of these compensatory mechanisms for alkalosis and acidosis. And we're also going to have fallout if we have obstruction of an airway, if we are unable to breathe in terms of our body's acids and bases. So it goes backwards and forwards. Make sure you can differentiate cause and effect here. And if we need to chart this out and sort of make it a linear story, we can absolutely do that. All right, that was the worst of it. How do you guys feel? Okay, good. Now, by now you should know what perfusion is. What's perfusion? If a blood vessel is perfused, not necessarily that it's oxygenated, there's blood in it, yeah. And I'm picking on you for a very specific reason. I did have a student in AMP2 say, you know, people have been using perfusion all along, but I have no idea what it means, and I'm just confessing. So it's quite possible that people have just been sitting here assuming that you understand what perfusion is without explaining it. Perfusion means that there is blood in a blood vessel as opposed to that blood vessel being blocked, as opposed to that blood vessel being constricted, as opposed to any other factor that would mean blood is not getting through a blood vessel. And that constriction and a lack of blood flow through a blood vessel, that's pretty normal, actually. So a lack of perfusion or perfusion means whether or not there's blood in it. I love this concept. I think it's a really cool concept. You have something called ventilation perfusion coupling. If an alveolus is ventilated, if there is air in it, atmospheric air is in an alveolus and it is ventilated, then that capillary bed around that alveolus will also be perfused. If an alveolus is not ventilated, if you're in tidal volume and you're maybe not filling up the apex of your lungs with atmospheric air all of the time, then the capillary bed around that alveolus will not be perfused. And that's for a very important reason. We want it to match. We want ventilation perfusion coupling. We want well-ventilated alveoli to be well-perfused, we want poorly ventilated alveoli to be poorly perfused. Because what happens if you perfuse the blood vessels around a poorly ventilated alveolus? Is that blood going to get oxygenated? No, and once it ends that, reaches the end of that capillary bed, it's still going back to the left side of the heart. What's supposed to be on the left side of the heart for blood? Oxygenated blood. So if we perfused poorly ventilated alveoli, we would be returning deoxygenated blood to the left side of the heart, and that wouldn't work out for us. So you have autonomic controls over this at a very, very fine-tuned level if you think about it. Your blood vessels are constricting or dilating in response to the presence of oxygen so that you have a match between ventilation and perfusion and all of the blood that makes it through that alveolus is adequately oxygenated 
before it makes it back to the left side of the heart. That's mind blowing to me. Like if you think about the number of alveoli you have in capillary beds and the fine tuned control that that's going to that that's going to require, like going for a run, the physiology of just exercising and perfusing all of those extra capillary beds that usually aren't perfused, that is super cool to me. I'm way into that. That autonomic innervation is via the <laughs> pulmonary plexus. Lucky for you, all of this is really intuitively named. I don't think anybody's ever had an issue naming the pulmonary plexus before and saying that it's in control of the respiratory system. Sympathetic stimulation results in bronchodilation. Parasympathetic results in bronchoconstriction. And if you had to make a mad guess, what cranial nerve would you say is in charge of parasympathetic innervation? Vagus. It's always vagus. I do want you to know the location of the respiratory control centers. Mostly they are located in the medulla oblongata, and you actually have an extra center, not extra, but another center located within the pons. So the medulla oblongata and the pons have respiratory control centers. That means they're detecting things like, yes, oxygenation level, but now we know it's just as important to monitor carbon dioxide concentration. So they monitor those factors, and that's going to control your, what we call, respiratory rate. We know today that that's actually ventilation rate but nurses are going to call it respiratory rate, and I'm just going to roll with that. In addition to sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation, you also have a very important spinal nerve. And we should actually be able to find the spinal nerve today as we do our dissection into our fetal pig thoracic cavities. Does anybody know the name of the nerve that innervates the respiratory diaphragm? Yeah. Phrenic nerve. Does anybody remember the spinal cord levels the spinal nerve levels that they come from. C. There's a saying for it. It's a really great saying. C345, keep the diaphragm alive. Which means if somebody's in a car accident and they injure their cervical spine, especially at C345, we're really going to worry about that respiratory diaphragm and whether they can voluntarily ventilate or involuntarily ventilate at that point. Wait, what's that again? 345, keep the diaphragm alive. C345, keep the diaphragm alive. Which means that cervical spine injuries are going to put us at risk for losing that diaphragmatic innervation. That's not the only thing it means. That's a really key thing that it means. Uh, and not surprisingly, and as kind of what we've been saying all day with pollutions and especially with smoking, yeah, that's absolutely going to increase your risk for um, lung cancer, as well as things like emphysema. Emphysema is actually collapsing of alveoli, especially in response to uh, toxins that are inhaled. So you can see the nice spongy histology of the normal uh, lung up here, and you can see a very distinct lack of patent alveoli. Those large spaces are not functioning functional alveoli. And that blackness that you see in there, those are dust cells that have tried, been trying to consume whatever horrible stuff this person has been inhaling, up to and including cigarette smoke. So it's not pretty. Um, there's some showing some moderate damage to alveolar structures. <coughs> dilated non-functional alveoli. If you don't have those capillary beds embedded in the walls, if you sort of break that endothelium, then you're not going to have that respiratory membrane. You're not going to be able to exchange gases over that epithelium. That's about it. Any questions before I stop the recording? <laughs>